Uh, welcome, everybody, to our third of our Momentum series. Um, at this rate, we're going to get pick up quite a bit of speed. Um, but I want to just open with a, a quick note. Uh, we're going to have questions in all the sessions, so if you guys could wait for the microphone to come down to you, because we're going to be videoing the whole thing, so for posterity. So welcome, everyone, and welcome Andy and our other speakers. Um, we've gotten together three times this winter to talk about Lake County and our momentum. We've talked about three things, what we're selling, who's buying, and probably the most important thing, the relationship. We've talked about soils, we've talked about climate, we've talked about our expertise, we talked about the wineries, the markets, our price point. Today we're going to talk about the relationship and perhaps key part. Making a great region is a connection between the seller and the vineyard, between the vineyard manager and the winemaker. Everything else, labels, marketing, press, all just support that. Without it, wine and a region will not reach its full potential. We have 500 of the best winemakers in North America within an hour or two hour drive of here. Our job is to let them know what we grow, to get to know the wines that they make, the styles, their brands, and how we can work together. <clears throat> that is what relationship is. So on that theme, we've asked our keynote speaker here to talk about wine relationships in Lake County. Uh, frankly, Andy does not need an introduction, but I'll do my best. Today, Andy Beckstoffer and his family farm 3,600 acres in California's north coast, including nearly 1,200 in Lake County. But he was there at the creation, starting in Napa in the 70s, when Napa's fate as a world-class wine region was not a foregone conclusion. And he was instrumental in making exactly that happen. He founded the Napa Valley Grape Growers, promoted AVAs such as Rutherford Dust, and led in the establishment extensive agricultural preserves totaling almost 53,000 acres at last count. In the past three years, according to a survey of wine spectator ratings, of the top 25 wines produced in the US, nine were produced from Backstopper fruit. These top rated wines were a combination of quality vineyards and demanding winemakers working together to make great wines. Last week, in announcing the purchase of another 60 acres in Red Hills, Andy stated, quote, we continue to believe that Cabernet Sauvignon from the Red Hills of Lake County offers the most exciting promise of any new wine from any area of the new world, bar none. So, Andy, a few simple questions. How is Napa North Coast built into a world-class Appalachian? Why have you and you and your family invested such resources in Lake County? And what does the future hold for our region? There's, these are not simple questions, obviously, but I'd like to add a fourth personal one. To boil it down, are relationships really the key to building a world-class wine region? With that, I'd like to uh, invite Andy Beckstoffer. Peter said that um, if I was going to come up and speak, I was going to have to grow a beard. So I did it. Uh, I first of all want to apologize to you all uh, for having to cancel last time. Uh, I don't know if uh, it's something uh, you can be as healthy as you want, eat as well as you want, uh, get as much exercise as you want, but things happen. And so one lesson of that is uh, we are not invincible <laughs> by any means. So take care of yourself. Um, let me say, first of all, that uh, I'm proud to be here. And I'm really, thank you for coming to, to hear this. We are, in most places, known as Napa growers. And we were there in the beginning in 1970. Um, 1970 was the, probably the start of the premium wine business in California, and certainly the Napa Valley. When we came in 1970, the premium wines were Palmasan and Almaden. Uh, I'm really proud of what we've accomplished in Napa Valley. Um, we did some of the old things we did better. Many, many things we did different. Um, we had a good history coming into the 1970s. 
we had two wineries, Inglenook and Boyu, who were, they really set the standard for Cabernet Sauvignon in America. And we had a guy named Andre Chelichev, who was renowned to be the most, uh, the dean of winemakers in America and, and known on the world, world scene. We had six, basically six wineries, two or three more new ones. Uh, most importantly, Robert Mondavi has decided to do his winery in 1966. But let me say to you that in 1970, Napa Valley was not wine country. It is now, but it was not in 1970. We came here in 1995, uh, and I think I would say that 1995-96 was the start of the premium wine business in Lake County. Uh, in those days, pears and walnuts, uh, bass fishing, and the Canoc Diane, what, what they, we were known for here. It's kind of interesting that in 1970, to many, many people, Napa County was known for Mola Avenue, which was the insane asylum, a nut house. And one of the first similarities I found between Napa and here was we both were known for the nut house, either Amola Avenue in Napa and the Canocti Inn here in Lake County. Uh, but pears and walnuts were known uh, since then, since 1995. We've done some of the old things better, and we've done lots of things differently. It's been great, great progress. Uh, there's lots of things we've done here have been good for the grape growers. Lots of things we have done here have been good for the wineries. And most everything we've done here has been good for this community. And that's extremely important. We have been good for Lake County. Um, Lake County is not, was not wine country in 1995. Lake, Lake County is not wine country today. So what you're going to see through this talk and as a forecast thing, our major goal as I see it for Lake County is to make Lake County wine country. And it can be done. It was done in Napa. When Peter asked me to come talk, he asked me to talk about, and I noticed he changed it again, but I'm not paying attention to that. Um, he asked me to talk about, one, how we got here to Lake County, uh, sort of how we do stuff and how we think, and then to review the Napa experience as a way of forecasting and suggesting what Lake County should do in the future. Um, and I'm going to try to review some of those things and see, try to draw some some, some suggestions for it, uh, and also hopefully enough detail that you can make your own decisions. But uh, please know that I'm not here to promote Napa County. I'm here to use that experience to help us decide where we should go in Lake County into the future. So how do we get here? Well, Phloxra hit Napa County about 1989. This thing falls down. But 1989. And so from 1889 to about 1995, we replanted the Napa Valley. We planted 95% of the Napa Valley. And we thought that we would then go and replant our vineyards in Mendocino County. We thought Philoxa would go there, and it really didn't. But we wanted to expand. We wanted to grow. And we want to grow, and what we want to plant is Cabernet Sauvignon for lots of reasons. And so we began to look around, and we only farm in the North Coast counties. Over the years, we've had plenty of opportunities to go to the Central Coast, to go to all those places. But if you know anything about the Central Coast, it's a totally different economic system than you have here. You have several growers who have size and very few, very large buyers. So 
large growers, large buyers, and only a few of them. Up here, the system here is we have a zillion growers and a zillion wineries. Wholly different system, wholly different way of operating. And also, we didn't want to spend our time or our manager's time in cars and airplanes, riding to the Central Coast and coming back. We are managers and not investors. And so if we're going to get involved with something, we're going to be boots on the ground, we're going to be involved in that. So we began to look around and see where we could go. And um, we looked at Sonoma County, and, and we are in Napa and Mendocino at this point. We looked at Sonoma County, but the truth of the matter is there's very little Cabernet ground in Sonoma County. And some of it is priced as high as Napa, but the returns aren't anything like that. But, and, and let me say to you, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but uh, Lake County just didn't look good from a grape growing wine quality point of view. So we knew that if we're going to come to Lake County, we, we must do something different. We, should, we needed to be at a different place and do something different. And so we began to look around. And we found what is now called the, the Red Hills area. It was elevation. We start farming at 2,000 feet. And we wanted to grow Cabernet. And this is the only place we grow on hillsides. But this is a different hillside. Usually on hillsides, we want uniformity in our vineyards. And the soil streaks all through the hillsides in most of this country, which is very, very difficult to get any uniformity in your vineyard. But in the Red Hills area, all that soil was blown on from the eruption of Mount Kanata. So it's very deep and extremely uniform. Uh, we found that we could have water. We did major uh, climate studies and found that the climate there was much like it is in the Napa Valley and in, and in Bordeaux, in terms of the, not only in terms of the, of the overall heat, but the diurnals, in other words. Napa Valley and Oakville has heat spikes that we don't get here, and we all get 32, 35 degree days, but, and we don't get fog here, but lots and lots of similarities. But one thing I want to make sure that people understand, because pe sometimes people don't understand, we did not come to Lake County because the land was cheap. We could have bought land for the exact same price per acre in Pope Valley and Napa County. What we couldn't get in Pope Valley and Napa County was the quality that we thought we could get in Lake County in the Red, in the Red Hills. So we found this Amber Knowles property was rough, roughly 700 acres of walnuts. Uh, started to be cleared. It was hillside. Uh, there were no soil streaks. We could get all the uniformity we wanted. And so we chose to come to Lake County and the Red Hills because we could thought we could grow better quality than we could in, in, in for example, in Pope Valley of, of Napa Valley. We thought that for uh, a bottle of wine that cost $20, $25, that people were looking for more, than, more for quality than they were for Appalachian. And we also thought, just like in Napa County, that once we got around here and been around a while, we could begin to find those sweet spots in the vineyard where we could do vineyard designation and we could charge a hell of a lot more than $20 a bottle. And so that's why we're here, and that's how we came, and that's why we continue to want to expand here in, in Lake County. So secondly, sort of who are we and second topic, who are we and sort of what do we believe and why do we do the things we do? Well, first of all, let me say we are, again, in Napa and Mendocino and now in Lake County, and we have roughly 1,000 acres in each of the counties. We're growers. We do not have a winery. We've never had a winery. We're pretty aggressive about the stuff we do. And in Napa County, when you're aggressive there and you're only a grower, you're your total motivation is generally seen to be, oh, he just wants to raise the price of grapes. That's not totally false, but it's not really the true story, the full story. We're really interested in Cabernet Sauvignon and in quality. Uh, we're interested in very much in trying to grow Cabernet that's not a commodity. As you know, in the agricultural commodity business, 
if there's a big crop, there's a low price. If there's a low crop, there's a high price. But if you have a specialty, a branded product, all that goes out the window. You get paid based on what the market will bear. And so we have tried very, very hard in Napa County and everywhere to grow the best quality we can and to vineyard designate the bottles. As Peter said, now nah, they're all vineyard designated bottles and there's a whole lot more, but it emphasizes the vineyard. When it's vineyard designation, it basically says the real determinant here is not the blending skills of the winemaker, but remember winemakers make wine, vineyards don't make wine. It really comes from the vineyard. And so we wanted to create brands, both family name and vineyard name brands that got us out of the commodity business. Well, yeah, we wanted to raise the price of grapes, but the way we wanted to do that is we wanted to raise the price of wine and then tie the price of grapes to it. You know, it makes no sense for us to raise the price of grapes and drive our clients out of business because their cost of sales is too good. Doesn't make any sense at all. So anything we can do to help the winery rate, make great wine, charge a higher price, just so we can tie the price of grapes to that, that's what we want to do when we're talking about raising prices. We are very, very concerned about agricultural preservation. And it's right at the top of the list in Napa County. It will become the top of the list in Lake County one day and in all these other counties. And if you're going to preserve agriculture, you're talking about preserving vineyards. And if vineyards are important, you've got to preserve them. If they're not important, you don't have to preserve them. But once we begin to get, get wines sold based on their vineyard designation, vineyards become important. So nobody's going to talk about getting rid of those vineyards anymore. And that's a major thing that's happened over the last several years. We also need, you know, we, we want, everybody wants to be sustainable. And people talk about sustainable in environmental terms, but sustainable is very important in financial terms as well. And so we need return on investment. We, we need to make money and we need to, re, we, we need to return revenue to the land as well as to the brand. And I would say to you, for example, in Napa County today, vineyards are the long-term economic highest and best use of that land. For everything else you hear about Napa, you can make, sell your property once you make some money one year, keep it in vineyards and grow quality grapes, and you'll make it every year. We also believe that you do best if you do it with partners. And I, that by that mean, I think, the growers and the vintners and the farm workers and the community. And I do mean the farm workers, and we've had a big thing with that over in Napa County. And we, as you'll find out, we had the United Farm Workers for almost 20 years. But what we've tried to do as growers, as growers, whether it's through the Napa Valley, Napa Valley Grape Growers Association, which we started, as you'll see, back in the 70s, we attempted to raise the, the economic, political, and social status of the growers. And I think that's something we want to do. We want grape growers to be part of the, of the program and not second-class citizens. And then we believe, and I'm this is why I mentioned it before, that if you look at a project, any project that you're doing, and that project is good for your company and really not good for the community, you better be careful because somebody's going to try to be getting to you. And probably at some point you're going you're to realize the lower end of your projections. But if you can do something that's good for your own company and for the community, you're going to get a lot of help through the ways, and you're probably going to be at the higher end. Your returns are probably going to be at the higher end of your projection. And so that's, it's very important to me to be able to say what we've done here in Lake County over the past 20 years has really been good for this community. Uh, you can see the standard of living has improved, the schools, the roads, farm workers, et cetera. So what we believe, you know, it's really not all that sophisticated. It's really pretty simple. 
we believe in, some, in doing something that's good for everybody, following intu intuition and then doing it aggressively. And that's what we do and that's sort of who we are. So we, that's how we came to that and that's going to be our story and that's when I tell you about my experience or our experience, you keep those things in mind if you would. Now, I'd like to, and again, the, the major charge that Peter gave me was to see if we could look at the Napa experience and somehow or another suggest what we should be doing in Lake County into the future. So I've, sort of, I've chosen a format where I'd like to look at the first 20 years in Napa County, from 1970 to 1990, those first 20 years. And then I'd like to look at Lake County's first 20 years in the premium wine business from 1995 to the current day. Then we'll look at Napa's second 20 years in the premium wine business and see if we can't get some suggestions of what we ought to be doing here in Lake County's second 20 years in the, in the wine business. And as I said before, I'm not here to promote Napa County. It doesn't need it. Um, but what I am here to try to do is to draw on that experience and share some of those experiences with you in the hopes of giving us some indication of where we should go in Lake County now and into the next 20 years. In Napa in 1970, there was no premium wine business, period. I, if you wait for that until I get ready, I don't know how you get that off. Okay, thank you. I'll get to you in a minute. Um, but, no, it's not that bad, no big deal. But one of the important things about uh, Napa in 1970, remember that, is they had an ag preserve. You know where Napa is, 60 miles from San Francisco, beautiful, all that stuff. But they had an ag preserve that said this land's gonna stay in agriculture, and that allowed people to invest in vineyards and wineries because they knew the agriculture was going to be there. They knew the vineyards was going to be there. And so that was an extremely, but it wasn't talked about at the time, but that was an extremely important effect of the Ag Preserve. Napa in 1970 had a really good history. They had Inglenook and they had Boyu. They had Cabernet Sauvignon more than anybody else. They had Andre Chelichev. And before long, they had Bob Mondavi. Uh, Andre Chelichev was the first, if you say, Napa icon, a production man. And sometime in the late 70s, Robert Mondavi took over in a marketing man. So the change from production orientation to a marketing orientation, uh, and the rest is history. There's six major wineries in, in Napa County, six that are probably 10 total, but six that counted. But Napa County, now I'll do it. They, no, I want, Napa County, let me say, in 1970, Napa County was not wine country. You can see that grapes counted for $7 million, or roughly 30% of the total crop re revenues in Napa County. Animal production was, seven, was twice that. Fruits, other fruits and nuts were, were bigger than that. A total of 25 million. Today, it is wine country. 98% of the agricultural production in Napa County now is wine grapes. In, in 19, I'll get that off. I don't know how to get that off. But anyway, um, in Napa County, uh, in 1970, we were farmers. We were farmers. We were tilling the soil. We were doing things like we'd done it before. And we began, we began to change that. In 1976, we formed the Napa Valley Grape Growers Association, 
specifically to raise the social, economic, and political position in county. You know, in most of agriculture, the processor is a first-class citizen, the producer of vineyard is a second-class citizen, and the farm worker is a third-class citizen. That's just where it is in agriculture. And we sought to change that. In other words, we sought to change the rules. We sought to change the way things were done in Napa. In 19, people don't know it, in 1977 through 1999, we went to the federal hearings, and we, you remember, but up until this got in effect, it was like 1983, to call a grape a wine Cabernet Sauvignon, all you needed was 51% of that grape to be Cabernet Sauvignon. And we joined with the consumers against the Wine Institute, against the Wine Institute, and we got that 51% change to 75%. And we got venue designation, or, I mean, sub-appellations to eight, and uh, that's also for your appellations, and for your sub-appellations and for your venue designation. But think about where wine quality would be today if you could continue to have Cabernet that was 49% Charbonneau or whatever the hell else we used to put in it. Uh, in, 19, in, in 1976, I think, the Grandpa Valley grape growers began to suggest grape prices. We had the audacity. What we wanted to, what we wanted to do, we wanted to focus the growers on what they should be getting. We needed to set some guidelines for the growers. We had a, a we had a set up a view shed ordinance. The growers joined with the community, not necessarily with the wineries. And in from 1987 to 1990, that it really hit the fan when we did the winery definition ordinance, which said that for any new or expanding winery, you had to use 75% grapes. We need to protect our brand. We need to make sure people knew that wines coming out of Napa were really from Napa. Uh, we started our company in 1970 because we couldn't find anybody else who wanted to take over the responsibility for the technology that we saw that was coming. Uh, we could find people who could farm 30 acres the old way we couldn't find anybody who could farm, who wanted to farm 100 acres the way we thought. And so we began this techni technical revolution in, in Napa. In 1971, we brought in drip irrigation. We spent a lot of money incentivizing uh, nurseries to do bench grafts. We changed our, rel our trellis systems. We changed our, many of you here remember, we used to plant all the vineyards 8 by 12. We changed all our row spacing. We, we went over, in 1970, the great frost of 1970, it was next to no overhead sprinklers. But what we did is that we brought quality on the back of technology. But we still were basically farmers in those days. But again, we changed the way, we changed the way we looked at things. We changed the quality way of looking at things. From 1976 to 1981, I was on the Napa County Planning Commission, and I think one month we had 28 winery proposals, use permit things come through. We created the Small Winery Ordinance. Well, by that, we made it easier for small wineries to get started. We didn't give them tax incentives, but we gave them great incentives to, to reduce a lot of that regulatory requirement. I also need to tell you, and in, in, in back in those days, let me say that in, in Napa County, we just weren't all about Cabernet. We were Cabernet, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, everything you can imagine. The focus in 1970 really wasn't what, like Cabernet like it is today. I also say to you that, that in, in 1980, the Napa Valley Vintners Association had no executive director. They called themselves a luncheon club, the Napa Valley Wine Auction didn't start until 1981. Also, what you have to say about Napa in those days, we're lucky, we're damn lucky. We're lucky with the 1976 Paris tasting, a wine won there who was never made again. Uh, somebody put that group together and didn't even include the Boyus and the Inglenooks, who were very prominent in those days. And then in 1989, 1990, that period ended. That period totally ended with Loxra. And we changed from being farmers to being viticulturists. 
we totally changed the way we thought about things for 20 years we'd been learning, but that marked the change. And that ended the first 20 years in Napa County. In Lake County, if we look at the first 20 years, I'm starting when we got here, and I think generally the, the premium was, was started about 1995. You know, there were grapes planted here and people talking about Lake County grapes. That's a study done in 1873. By a guy named Minsky, about the same time Napa started. Um, but we really had no, no good history here for grapes in 1995. Some of you may remember that uh, Lake County was really the North Coast stepchild. In the 1980s, when we began to set up Appalachians, we were setting up the North Coast, and the people from Mendocino were trying, actually tried to exclude Lake County from the North Coast. Um, KJ had abandoned uh, Lakeport about that time. And the quality in 1995, and I don't want to offend anybody who may have been growing grapes back then or before then, it really wasn't all that great. Uh, we thought, and again, this is my, my story, that we had the wrong varieties planted in the wrong places in, uh, in Lake County. In 1995, when we came up, we couldn't find any farm workers up here. We were really worried that we could find farm workers and more importantly, vineyard managers, foremen, et cetera. Uh, there was no, no public relations, no, no publicity for Lake County. There was no marketing and there was just little respect for Lake County grapes. But from then on, uh, from 1995 on, brought a lot of new technology into this valley. People from other places began to do things both from a quality point of view and an environmental point of view that hadn't been done before. There was a tremendous amount of planting of grapes that happened from 1995 until today. And a lot of new players came in to the area. We came, some wineries came. And so uh, let me show you that, well, let me just say to you that, that uh, Lake County was not wine country then, then, but great progress has been made. Can I go there? How do I get the next one? Can I get the next one? Here you go. In 1995, grapes counted for six million, almost seven million dollars of $42 million in agricultural production in Lake County. You can see what pears were in the big time. But look at it now. It's 56% of total uh, agricultural production in Lake County. So we're not Lake County yet, but we've made great progress. In 2003, uh, we created, there were six of us, I believe, who created the Red Hills Appalachian because we wanted to get something at a little more pizzazz, a little more local, and we wanted to not have to emphasize Lake, Lake County that much. And we went to the Red Hills, into the Red Hills area. I think today there are, Deborah's telling me seven sub-appellations, and I can't name them all, but it's Red Hills and High Valley and Clear Lake and Gwinnock and seven of them here. That's progress, that's, that's lots of progress. What we said, and we brought a lot of people up here in 1996 and 97, and we created a brochure. Can you do that? Can I do that? There it is. That's what we were saying to the world, and we were Napa growers. We were, that's what we were saying to the world in the late 1990s. The most promising new wine from the new world of wine, and that means Argentine Melbec and New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, we thought that Cabernet from Lake County, from the Red Hills, was the most promising new wine in all the new world of wine. Um, that's a pretty bold statement, but I believed it then and I, and I believe it today. Um, we had major plantings over, over, the, over the period from 1995 until today in Lake County. In Lake County, you, in 19... 
1995, there were 4,291 acres of grapes in Lake County. Today, it's almost double 8,156 acres of wine grapes in, Na in Napa County. Um, ma major, major progress. Uh, in 1995, there were 2,287 tons of Cabernet Sauvignon planted in Lake County. The total was, the, was 8,520 tons. Today, there are almost 12,000 tons of Cabernet produced in Lake County of a total of over 34,000. The, uh, the quality in 2013 um, is great. I would remind you of what was said here at the last Momentum Conference in, in January. None of those speakers who are charting the world of wine from a marketing point of view had any, has any problem with the quality of grapes coming from Lake County. They wanted us to do marketing things, but had no problem with the quality of grapes here. They wouldn't have said that in 1995. Today, uh, 19, in 2013, we have gotten major publicity from the Wall Street Journal, from the Wine Spectator, and from many other, uh, many other publications. Uh, our Wine Commission, uh, and I've got to give Peter great credit for this, is really up and running and doing a great job. It's doing a great job, just as the Napa, Vent Napa Valley Grape Growers, Napa Valley Vintners are doing over there. Um, so if you look at the first 20 years of the wine experience in Napa and the first 20 years of the wine experience in Lake County, there are lots of similarities, lots and lots of similarities. We didn't start, as, start out as strong as they did but in Napa County, but we've done in the same area, in the same ways, we've done, we've done a great, great job the first 20 years. So now let's look at the second 20 years in Napa. 1990s to, to, ten, to 2010s. Well, the first thing that happened was the phylloxera replant. And we, in Napa County, we had to replace our rootings, but we replaced everything. We replaced our rootings, our signs, we replaced our trellis systems, we, we, we big time replaced the way we thought about vine manipulation and the way we thought about yields and quality. We truly changed in the 1990 from farmers to being viticulturists. Uh, we changed all of those things, which I say to you about the vine manipulation and the other, but the main thing we changed was it just a real emphasis on the timing of what we did. You got to do it right, but the, when you do it, the timing is extremely important. Uh, in Napa County in the last, in the in Napa County in the second 20 years, they went from six or seven, 10 wineries to over 400. By 2000, we developed, based on the quality of fruit we now had, the whole cult wine uh, business began. There was not a $100 bottle of wine before 2000, and there wasn't a $100 bottle of wine made from fruit that wasn't replanted, basically, after the, after the phylloxera uh, infestation. We changed, uh, we changed it to a to a vineyard emphasis um, in Napa County. They used to be that the best wines were a reserve, which basically said, promoted the blending skills of, of the winemaker. And we changed the vineyard designation. And we changed the bottle pricing. We pricing, and if, a lot of it's done in a direct way, but now the focus is not on, is it a big crop or is it a small crop? The focus is on what's the price of the bottle my grapes are going into and I should be paid based on that, that value, not on the fact that there happens to be a big, big crop or small crop. And today, uh, we've gone through the production man, uh, Andre Chelyshev. We've gone through the marketing man, Bob Mandavi. And the new icon, the reason for the greatness of the Napa Valley is now began to realize it's the vineyards. More and more the new icon of the valley has gone from those people to the, to the vineyards themselves. And after 2000 and, and lately, 
we've gone, we went from farmers to viticulturists, and now I think it can be said that we've gone from viticulturists to being stewards of the land. It's very important, the environmental things, preserving our land is extremely important to us in Napa County, and we've made that progress over the last 40 years. The, the Napa Valley Grape Growers has great strength today. Uh, the WDO and the, getting that 75% rule sort of improved the status of the grape growers and said, hey, everybody better deal with the grape growers too. Also important that today, after the second 20, Cabernet is king. Cabernet is king. There's just no question about it in Napa County. Yeah, they grow some Chardonnay and some Pinot Noir, but nobody's going to say the best Chardonnay grows there at Pinot Noir. Maybe somebody will. We will. We've got some Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. It's great. But Cabernet is king, and I think, and this is my thing, I think the great wine growing regions, and again, I love Burgundy, uh, but I think the Cabernet regions. If you're really going to be on the top, you're going to have to grow great Cabernet. The Napa Valley Great Bros the Napa Valley Vendors Association can't underestimate what they've done in terms of major marketing. They had no executive director. I think today they have 18 or 19 people working there. They've got over a million dollar budget for their operation. We have the Napa Valley Wine Auction that you hear about. We have tasting rooms that are more and more directed to, to uh, direct to consumer. Uh, great publicity it is today, the wine country. And there's great outreach and part of the vendors for US and foreign things. We tax ourselves to pay for our farm workers farm workers' housing. And today you just have to say that Napa County is not only wine country, it's world-class wine country. Come a long ways in that second 20 years. So what would I suggest to you, to me, to us, for Lake County for our next 20, 20 years, from now until the 2030s, I guess that's when it'll happen. The first thing is that we should do everything we possibly can to make, Napa, to make Lake County the new wine country. As if you were here for the last, last uh, Momentum Conference, everybody said the new millenniums who are our new wine drinkers, they're looking for something new. They don't want to drink Napa. They don't want to drink your grandfather's wine. They want something new. They're looking to experiment. And Lake County is the most promising place where they can go. And we need to do that both for the commission, but for the county and all the county representatives and government. And they should do that because I think the wine country, the wine business, is good for this community, is good for the revenues, is good for the standard of living in Lake County. Secondly, we need to emphasize the vineyards. You need to emphasize the quality and the value that we that we support with, with the vineyards. We and you need to segment out our good vineyards with that good quality and find those sweet spots. You could cut your yields, do what you have to do, and get the winemakers to use their best barrels and techniques and begin to do some vineyard designation here. Improve your technology in the vineyards to produce that quality wine, just as they did in Napa. I think the commission ought to recommend grape prices. In, Napa, in Lake County. And I think that will bring the growers together, will give them a benchmark, give them an idea of where they should go, and it'll focus people on the plight and the revenues of the vineyards. I think that in uh, marketing, we should emphasize the sub appellations. Napa County doesn't sell any wine. Sonoma County doesn't sell any wine. Mendocino doesn't sell any wine. Napa Valley sounds like somewhere where you grow grapes. Sonoma Valley, Anderson Valley, Alexander Valley. And I, and I think that through the commission efforts, through the commission efforts, we should begin to emphasize these sub-appellations we have that are very well named. And I'm going to suggest that the sub-appellations Begin, that, the, that the commission, through the commission, begin to set up committees for the individual sub-appellations to promote themselves, to put some money behind the major publicity efforts, promotion efforts for these sub-appellations. It's easy for us to do Red Hills. It's easy for Clay to do High, high, high Mountain, High Valley, whatever. Uh, 
but localize that thing and, and get the growers in those areas to promote themselves. Nextly, I think we ought to emphasize Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc. Over 50% of the tons produced, grapes produced in um, Lake County are Cabernet Sauvignon and Sauvignon Blanc. Cabernet Sauvignon from Lake County is today the third highest selling price per ton Cabernet in California. It's ahead of Mendocino now, it's behind only Napa and Sonoma. And we need to promote that. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon today, if you look at the wine world in the United States, Chardonnay is approximately 19% of the market and it's growing at 2% a year. Cabernet is 16% 6, of the market and it's growing at 16, it's growing at 6% a year. Cabernet will soon be the highest selling variety in the United States. We ought to be part of that. We ought to be the new Cabernet. Lastly, we should seek county tax incentives and um, less restrictions on winery development up here. We need wineries. We need those small, those new winemakers, those assistant winemakers. I think as Peter said, 500 of the best winemakers in the world are within 100 miles of here or 60 miles of here. We need to bring them up here. We need the county to understand that we're good for the county. We need to make this wine country and that they need to give these people incentives, tax incentives, if you will, incentives as we, again, as we did in Napa with the small winery ordinance to make it a whole lot easier for them to come up here and to grow and to build their wineries. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. I think the future is our story and we very much want to be a part of it. So thanks for coming. If anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them now or they can come later or however you want. Please raise your hand. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, I'm uh, from the Russian River Valley Wine Growers. And you came one day, and I, when you had your act canceled the thing here, I said, man, that happened twice. Anyway, good to see it. Um, what do you, uh, can you share any of your thoughts on um, price per acre of land uh, undeveloped, uh, say, 40, 40 acres and above lots, something like that? In Lake County? Yes. Here? here? Yeah, yes, Lake County, I'm sorry. I think it's pretty fluid. I mean, I think it's pretty fluid. I, I think, and again, you're going to find it more and more important. Does it have water or does it not have water? And that's a, that's a big difference. Uh, do you have to frost protect it or don't you have to frost protect it? Uh, what are the soils like? Can you grow Cabernet? Now, if you have all of those kinds of things going for you, uh, you probably could pay more than you're going to have to. And the price, and again, I don't know, is probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars an acre. But within that range, I mean, there's no average price. Average price doesn't mean anything because you can buy something cheap with no water. You can buy something cheaper that you have to spend two thousand, two three thousand dollars an acre to put frost protection in. Uh, you can you can uh, find something that's heavy and you can't plant Cabernet on, and so that all goes out the window. So I guess the basic answers I'm not sure you'd have to look at a piece of property an individual piece of property another question over here yeah hello my name's Teresa what is the minimum elevation for Cabernet the lowest you would grow obviously you want the higher elevation well you know in, in Napa County we grow Cabernet a hundred feet above sea level I don't think you even have any of that in Lake County do you no. And so it doesn't, I, I think that, I think it's a different Cabernet, and I think it's a different Cabernet at elevation than it is lower for reasons I can't quantify. I think the quality of light, light is different, and I think that affects the grape. I think the barometric pressures and things are different. And so you got those kind of things, but you really have got to have, 
you've got to have well-drained soil. And, and that's not the total answer because you've also got to have balanced soils. Now we can add some, some, um, some soil amendments, but if, unless they're way out of balance. But I don't think elevation is going to be the big, big determinant. Uh, we found the, the land at elevation here because we found the soils there. We found we, couldn't, we didn't have to frost protect it, no. But you could find it in lower places if your soil and climate was right. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Um, how did you go about marketing your various vineyards in Napa? So how does Tokelon different than Missouri Hopper, and, and what did you do, and how would that apply to us up here in Lake County? Well, we, when we bought Tokelon, Tokelon was a part of the BV system, and it went into the private reserve blend. And so the first thing we did is we, we upgraded to the most modern technology we could get, and we told everybody we were doing it. And then we sought the, not only the best winemakers, but also the most promising young winemakers. Who were owned by or worked for? People who understood quality and willing, were willing to pay for it. And we put the grapes in their hands at prices that weren't that far out of reach with everybody else. And then, and we did that because if we had put it in the hands of one winemaker and he'd done very well with it, uh, they'd say, oh, the winemaker's a genius. But if we put it in the hands of 20 winemakers and they all do well, people say, well, maybe it's the vineyard. And that's what happened. And that happened over a period of 10 years. And it's beginning to happen. It happened to Dr. Crane, beginning to happen at Missouri Hopper and those other things. But remember, pe people say you love to hear wine's made in the vineyard. Well, winemakers make wine. And you've got to put it in the hands of a winemaker who understands and has the, the same kind of quality appreciation that you have. And he's got to, he's got to, so the, finance, the people behind him have to understand you've got to pay for that. You've got to buy the barrels and things like that. And they've got to understand quality and they've got to know how to market it. The shame of it is that you put the super quality grapes, which is the case, lots of places over there. They put in this blend of a $40 bottle of wine. Well, if you segment it out, it's really $100 grapes, $100 bottle of grapes. You got to get it in the hands of the people who can, who can do that. Andy, I have a question. Uh, regard, you had mentioned the, up here. Where are you? <laughs> Back here. Oh, okay. I'm Chad with Valley Grape Growers. You had mentioned um, tying price per ton into the bottle price. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, what we did was, and we, we started doing this in, actually I can show you back in 1977, posters from the, from the Napa Valley grape growers. It, it took off really in the 2000s, so we were overnight success. But what we did was we went back to the 1970s and we sought to find out what, one, what the total revenues from a, wine, from a winery were on a ton of grapes. And we sought to find out what was the historic percentage of that total revenue that went to the grape growers. So we developed a formula that said half of the bottle price, because it was, everything was sold in FOB then, times 12, which is a case of wine, times this percentage, which we were looking for, times the amount of cases per ton the winery got. In those days, it was like 65 plus. So it was an occasion of 50% 50, 50 of retail price times the cases per ton times this percentage. And I could show you all sorts of things, but it came up that that percentage was 26%. And if you take 50% of retail times 26% times 65, you'll get 100 times the retail bottle price. And that's how it was done. It was done on a formula that was the historic price of the wine and the historic percentage that the grape growers got. Now, if I would show you that work, it's kind of interesting because the premium bottles of wine were selling for $7.50. So 
So the story is not really so much that the price of grapes has increased. The story is that the price of wine has increased, and we've tied the price of grapes to it. On that historic percentage, and we, haven't ch we didn't change that percentage. We didn't make that percentage up. Now we're changing again because that 50% of wholesale isn't the way the winery markets its product anymore. In the wines that we're talking about here, 60, 80% of it goes direct to consumer and the winery gets 100% of that. And then I split it with a wholesaler. And the wineries don't get 65 cases per ton anymore, they get like 55 cases per ton. You put that back in the formula with the 26% and it comes up more than 100, more than 100 times bottle price. But it's, it's all based on the winery's revenue and the, the grower's historic percentage of that. So we're really interested in increasing the winery's total revenue. And when we started this, I mean, to be very honest about it, we started back in 74, 75, it's because the price of grapes was way down and the quality was up. So we were looking to, we were looking to sh get a proper sharing, if you would, of the profitability of the wine business, and that's happened. But more importantly, it's put the grower and the vintner on the same page. You know, it, traditionally, again, in agriculture, the grower wants to overproduce and the winery wants to underpay. That's just the way it works. We don't do that anymore. We'll do anything we can within reason to make the quality better for the, in the hands of the good winemaker, the guy that knows how to market it, because if he makes more money, we make more money. And it's produced better wines, in my, in my view and the view of many people. And that's the major thing that's happened with that, with that pricing. One more question back here. Hi, I'm just wondering what you are doing or what plans are in the works for bringing new wine growers into the county or, or developing them here in the county. I'm, I'm not sure I understood your question. You were talking about encouraging young people as well as older people <laughs> to buy in the valleys as well as on, on the hills. And I'm wondering if there are any plans for the whole group of Lake County wine growers or the winemakers to, to help people. You, you say you want to help them, and I'm wondering how that's going to take place or how could it take place? Well, we really don't want to encourage too many more people to come, and come, and come up here and buy good vineyards. We like to buy them ourselves, but we're not worried about those guys. But what we would like to do is encourage vendors to come up and make wine. And that's where we, we tell them that we will do what we need to do to produce that better quality. We, we've got good quality to produce that special quality, those, find those special spots in the vineyard. And we will do what we need to do. We need to convince the county to come here and, and give them the kind of incentives, any incentives they can to come up here. And then we need to promote these sub-appellations, which are best, that they begin to know that these millenniums are looking for Red Hills. Where do I find Red Hills Cabernet? I've heard it's really great. I've heard it's the new thing. I heard it's, it's not just that old Napa Valley Cabernet all over again. Those are the kind of things, it's the push and the pull that brings new wineries and new winemakers up here because they are there, the assistant winemakers of lots of these places, they, they're very good. And they just, in many parts, just aced out of Napa. They should be coming up here. Okay, if there are no other questions, please join me in thanking Andy for being here. <laughs>